Book Talk begins at 2 minutes 40 seconds. Welcome to Craft Lit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 617, Mousetrap. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Well, hello, how are you? I'm the same way that I was for the last two weeks. <laughs> so, not much new to say. I did promise you, though, last week I mentioned Sarah Humphrey's embroidery YouTube channels. This week, I wanted to share one of the other things that I've been working on. My friend Pam here, you may have started following her because during, I know I mentioned her Instagram during the last book, Pam Thompson Art. Pam is incredibly talented at botanical art drawings and she doesn't have anyone to do it with around here. So (laughs) she hooked me up. And so now I am taking classes from Wendy as well. They're all online classes and it's, it's the art of botanical drawing, kind of like the kinds of botanical illustrations that you would have seen in curiosity cabinets and things like that. It's extraordinary. It's so hard. It is very zen. Once you get past getting the shape right and getting the shading basically blocked in, then it is using Faber-Castell pencils, color pencils, and tiny, tiny, tiny little circular blendings and burnishing of the layers. There are at least 200 separate layers of various color pencils on a tomato that I did. And I will share the tomato (laughs) on my Instagram so that you can have a look at, at what the sucker looks like. It looks like a tomato, so I'm not unhappy. But yeah, it took way longer than you would have thought. Alrighty, for today's chapter, chapter 10, the name of the chapter is A Mousetrap in the 17th Century. I pulled out my trusty OED, my very, very old, tired, used, but well-loved OED, to look up actually two words for this week. The first one is mousetrap. This I found really interesting. 1475, the phrase mousetrap was used in discussing the catching of mice. Prior to that, there had been a bunch of other things that they said, things like mouse snare. They were all variations on basically a trap idea or a something falling on top of said mouse. In 1577, 102 years later, that was the first time that anybody in writing that the OED knows about used the phrase mousetrap in describing people. Interesting, right? I love that. The other term that I had to look up was alibi. I was very curious because Dumas brings it up specifically. So, of course, I had to go looking. It turns out that originally, alibi was an adverb that meant elsewhere. So, if you were on trial, you would try to prove yourself alibi, prove yourself elsewhere. And it was used that way in writing for a while. But the first use of the noun version, the you need an alibi, came in 1774. So there you go. Cool little things. That is literally all I have to give you today. The rest of it I have to talk to you about on the flip side. So if you are listening to The Three Musketeers on a different version you can flip over to 26 minutes and 58 seconds. Otherwise, here we go here with chapter 10 of The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, 
A mouse trap in the 17th century. A mouse trap in the 17th century. The invention of the mouse trap does not date from our days. As soon as societies informing had invented any kind of police, that police invented mouse traps. As perhaps our readers are not familiar with the slang of the Rue de Jerusalem, and as it is fifteen years since we applied this word for the first time to this thing, allow us to explain to them what is a mouse trap. When in a house of whatever kind it may be, an individual suspected of any crime is arrested, the arrest is held secret. Four or five men are placed in ambuscade in the first room. The door is open to all who knock. It is closed after them, and they are arrested, so that at the end of two or three days they have in their power almost all the habitues of the establishment, and that is a mouse trap. The apartment of Monsieur Bonacieux then became a mouse trap, and whoever appeared there was taken and interrogated by the cardinal's people. It must be observed that as a separate passage led to the first floor, in which D'Artagnan lodged, those who called on him were exempted from this detention. Besides, nobody came thither but the three musketeers. They had all been engaged in earnest search and inquiries, but had discovered nothing. Athos had even gone so far as to question Monsieur de Treville, a thing which, considering the habitual reticence of the worthy musketeer, had very much astonished his captain. But Monsieur de Treville knew nothing, except that the last time he had seen the cardinal, the king, and the queen, the cardinal looked very thoughtful, the king uneasy, and the redness of the queen's eyes donated that she had been sleepless or tearful. But this last circumstance was not striking, as the queen, since her marriage, had slept badly and wept much. M. de Treville requested Athos, whatever might happen, to be observant of his duty to the king, but particularly to the queen, begging him to convey his desires to his comrades. As to D'Artagnan, he did not budge from his apartment. He converted his chamber into an observatory. From his windows he saw all the visitors who were caught. Then, having removed a plank from his floor and nothing remaining but a simple ceiling between him and the room beneath, in which the interrogatories were made, he heard all that passed between the inquisitors and the accused. The interrogatories, preceded by a minute's search, operated upon the persons arrested, were almost always framed thus. Has Madame Bonacieux sent anything to you for her husband or any other person? Has Monsieur Bonacieux sent anything to you for his wife or for any other person? Has either of them confided anything to you by word of mouth? If they knew anything, they would not question people in this manner, said D'Artagnan to himself. Now, what is it they want to know? Why, they want to know if the Duke of Buckingham is in Paris— and if he has had or is likely to have an interview with the queen. D'Artagnan held on to this idea, which, from what he had heard, was not wanting in probability. In the meantime, the mouse trap continued in operation, and likewise D'Artagnan's vigilance. On the evening of the day after the arrest of poor Bonacieux, as Athos had just left D'Artagnan to report at Monsieur de Treville's, as nine o'clock had just struck, and as Planchet, who had not yet made the bed was beginning his task, a knocking was heard at the street door. The door was instantly opened and shut. Someone was taken in the mousetrap. D'Artagnan flew to his hole, laid himself down on the floor at full length and listened. Cries were soon heard and then moans, which someone appeared to be endeavoring to stifle. There were no questions. The devil, said D'Artagnan to himself. It seems like a woman. They search her. She resists. They use force. The scoundrels! In spite of his prudence, D'Artagnan restrained himself with great difficulty from taking a part in the scene that was going on below. But I tell you that I am the mistress of the house, gentlemen. I tell you I am Madame Bonacieux. I tell you I belong to the queen, cried the unfortunate woman. Madame Bonacieux, murmured D'Artagnan. Can I be so lucky as to find what everybody is seeking for? The voice became more and more indistinct. A tumultuous movement shook the partition. The victim resisted as much as a woman could resist four men. Pardon, gentlemen, p pardon, murmured the voice, which could now only be heard in inarticulate sounds. 
They are binding her. They are going to drag her away, cried D'Artagnan to himself, springing up from the floor. My sword! Good, it is by my side. Planchet! Monsieur! Run and seek Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. One of the three will certainly be at home, perhaps all three. Tell them to take arms, to come here, and to run. Ah, I remember. Athos is at Monsieur de Treville's. But where are you going, monsieur? Where are you going? I am going down by the window, in order to be there the sooner, cried D'Artagnan. You put back the boards, sweep the floor, go out at the door, and run as I told you. Oh, monsieur, monsieur, you will kill yourself, cried Planchet. Hold your tongue, stupid fellow, said D'Artagnan, and laying hold of the casement, he let himself gently down from the first story, which fortunately was not very elevated, without doing himself the slightest injury. He then went straight to the door and knocked, murmuring, I will go myself and be caught in the mouse trap, but woe be to the cats that shall pounce upon such a mouse. The knocker had scarcely sounded under the hand of the young man before the tumult ceased, steps approached, the door was open, and D'Artagnan, sword in hand, rushed into the rooms of Monsieur Bonacieux, the door of which, doubtless acted upon by a spring, closed after him. Then those who dwelt in Bonacieux's unfortunate house, together with the nearest neighbors, heard loud cries, stamping of feet, clashing of swords, and breaking of furniture. A moment after, those who, surprised by this tumult, had gone to their windows to learn the cause of it, saw the door open and four men, clothed in black, not come out of it, but fly, like so many frightened crows, leaving on the ground and on the corners of the furniture feathers from their wings, that is to say, patches of their clothes and fragments of their cloaks. D'Artagnan was conqueror, without much effort it must be confessed, for only one of the officers was armed, and even he defended himself for forum's sake. It is true that the three others had endeavored to knock the young man down with chairs, stools, and crockery, but two or three scratches made by the Gascon's blade terrified them. Ten minutes sufficed for their defeat, and D'Artagnan remained master of the field of battle. The neighbors who had opened their windows, with the coolness peculiar to the inhabitants of Paris in these times of perpetual riots and disturbances, closed them again as soon as they saw the four men in black flee, their instinct telling them that, for the time, all was over. Besides, it began to grow late, and then, as today, people went to bed early in the quarter of the Luxembourg. On being left alone with Madame Bonacieux, D'Artagnan turned toward her. The poor woman reclined where she had been left, half fainting upon an armchair. D'Artagnan examined her with a rapid glance. She was a charming woman of twenty-five or twenty-six years, with dark hair, blue eyes, and a nose slightly turned up, admirable teeth, and a complexion marbled with rose and opal. There, however, ended the signs which might have confounded her with a lady of rank. The hands were white but without delicacy. The feet did not bespeak the woman of quality. Happily, D'Artagnan was not yet acquainted with such niceties. While D'Artagnan was examining Madame Bonacieux, and was, as we have said, close to her, he saw on the ground a fine cambric handkerchief, which he picked up as was his habit, and at the corner of which he recognized the same cipher he had seen on the handkerchief which had nearly caused him and Aramis to cut each other's throat. From that time, D'Artagnan had been cautious with respect to handkerchiefs with arms on them, and he therefore placed in the pocket of Madame Bonacieux the one he had just picked up. At that moment, Madame Bonacieux discovered her senses. She opened her eyes, looked around her with terror, saw that the apartment was empty and that she was alone with her liberator. She extended her hands to him with a smile. Madame Bonacieux had the sweetest smile in the world. Ah, oh, monsieur, said she, you have saved me. Permit me to thank you. Madame, said D'Artagnan, I have only done what every gentleman would have done in my place. You owe me no thanks. Oh, yes, monsieur, oh, yes. I hope to prove to you that you have not served an ingrate. But what could these men, whom I at first took for robbers, want with me? And why is monsieur Bonacieux not here? Madame, those men were more dangerous than any robbers could have been for they are the agents of the cardinal. And as to your husband, Monsieur Bonacieux, 
He is not here because he was yesterday evening conducted to the Bastille. My husband in the Bastille, cried Madame Bonacieux. Oh, my God, what has he done? Poor dear man, he is innocence itself. And something like a faint smile lighted the still terrified features of the young woman. What has he done, madame? said D'Artagnan. I believe that his only crime is to have at the same time the good fortune and the misfortune to be your husband. But, monsieur, you know then. I know that you have been abducted, madame. And by whom? Do you know him? Oh, if you know him, tell me. By a man of forty to forty-five years, with black hair, a dark complexion, and a scar on his left temple. That is he, that is he, but his name? Uh, his name? I do not know that. And did my husband know I had been carried off? He was informed of it by a letter written to him by the abductor himself. And does he suspect, said Madame Bonacieux with some embarrassment, the cause of this event? He attributed it, I believe, to a political cause. I doubted from the first, and now I think entirely as he does. Then my dear Monsieur Bonacieux has not suspected me a single instant? So far from it, madame, he was too proud of your prudence, and above all, of your love. A second smile, almost imperceptible, stole over the rosy lips of the pretty young woman. But, continued D'Artagnan, how did you escape? I took advantage of a moment when they left me alone, and as I had known since morning the reason of my abduction, with the help of the sheets I let myself down from the window. Then, as I believed my husband would be at home, I hastened hither. To place yourself under his protection? Oh, no, poor dear man. I knew very well that he was incapable of defending me, but, as he could serve us in other ways, I wished to inform him. Of what? Oh, that is not my secret. I must not therefore tell you. Besides, said D'Artagnan, pardon me, madame, if guardsman as I am, I remind you of prudence. Besides, I believe we are not here in a very proper place for imparting confidences. The men I have put to flight will return reinforced. If they find us here, we are lost. I have sent for three of my friends, but who knows whether they were at home. Yes, yes, you are right, cried the affrighted Madame Bonacieux. Let us fly. Let us save ourselves. At these words, she passed her arm under that of D'Artagnan and urged him forward eagerly. But whither shall we fly? Whither escape? Let us first withdraw from this house. Afterwards we shall see. The young woman and the young man, without taking the trouble to shut the door after them, descended the Rue de Fossoyeurs rapidly, turned into the Rue de Fossé Monsieur le Prince, and did not stop till they came to the Place Saint-Sulpice. "'And now, what are we to do, and where do you wish me to conduct you?' asked D'Artagnan. "'I am at quite a loss how to answer you, I admit,' said Mademoiselle Bonacieux. My intention was to inform Monsieur Laporte, through my husband, in order that Monsieur Laporte might tell us precisely what had taken place at the Louvre in the last three days, and whether there is any danger in presenting myself there. But I, said D'Artagnan, can go and inform Monsieur Laporte. No doubt you could, only there is one misfortune, and that is that Monsieur Bonacieux is known at the Louvre and would be allowed to pass, whereas you are not known there, and the gate would be closed against you. Ah, bah, said D'Artagnan. You have at some wicket of the Louvre a concierge who is devoted to you, and who, thanks to a password, would... Madame Bonacieux looked earnestly at the young man. And if I give you this password, 
said she. Would you forget it as soon as you used it? By my honor, by the faith of a gentleman, said D'Artagnan with an accent so truthful that no one could mistake it. Then I believe you. You appear to be a brave young man. Besides, your fortune may perhaps be the result of your devotedness. I will do without a promise and voluntarily all that I can do to serve the king and be agreeable to the queen. Dispose of me, then, as a friend. But I? Where shall I go, meanwhile? Is there nobody from whose house Monsieur Laporte can come and fetch you? No, I can trust nobody. Stop, said D'Artagnan. We are near Athos's door. Yes, here it is. Who is Athos? One of my friends. But if he should be at home and see me... He is not at home, and I will carry away the key after having placed you in his apartment. But if he should return... Oh, he won't return, and if he should, he will be told what I have brought a woman with me, and that woman is in his apartment. But that will compromise me sadly, you know. Of what consequence? Nobody knows you. Besides, we are in a situation to overlook ceremony. Come, then. Let us go to your friend's house. Where does he live? Rue Ferru, two steps from here. Let us go. Both resumed their way, as D'Artagnan had foreseen. Athos was not within. He took the key which was customarily given him as one of the family, ascended the stairs, and introduced Madame Bonacieux into the little apartment of which we have given a description. "'You are at home,' said he. "'Remain here, fasten the door inside, and open it to nobody unless you hear three taps like this.' He tapped thrice two taps close together and pretty hard, the other after an interval and lighter. "'That is well,' said Madame Bonacieux. "'Now, in my turn, let me give you my instructions.' "'I am all attention.' "'Present yourself at the wicket of the Louvre on the side of the Rue de l'Echelle, and ask for Germain.' "'Well, and then?' "'He will ask you what you want.' and you will answer by these two words, Tor and Bruxelles. He will at once put himself at your orders. And what shall I command him? To go and fetch Monsieur Laporte, the Queen's valet de chambre. And when he shall have informed him, and Monsieur Laporte is come, you will send him to me? That is well, but where and how shall I see you again? Do you wish to see me again? Certainly. Well, let that care be mine and be at ease. I depend upon your word. You may. D'Artagnan bowed to Madame Bonacieux, darting at her the most loving glance that he could possibly concentrate upon her charming little person, and while he descended the stairs, he heard the door closed and double locked. In two bounds he was at the Louvre, as he entered the wicket of L'Echelle, ten o'clock struck. All the events we have described had taken place within a half hour. Everything fell out as Madame Bonacieux prophesied. On hearing the password, Germain bowed. In a few minutes, Laporte was at the lodge. In two words, D'Artagnan informed him where Madame Bonacieux was. Laporte assured himself, by having it twice repeated, of the accurate address, and set off at a run. Hardly, however, had he taken ten steps before he returned. "'Young man,' said he to D'Artagnan, "'a suggestion!' "'What?' "'You may get into trouble by what has taken place.' "'You believe so?' "'Yes. Have you any friend whose clock is too slow?' "'Well?' "'Go and call upon him, in order that he may give evidence of your having been with him at half-past nine. In a court of justice, that is called an alibi.' D'Artagnan found his advice prudent. He took to his heels and was soon at Monsieur de Treville's. But instead of going into the saloon with the rest of the crowd, he asked to be introduced to Monsieur de Treville's office. As D'Artagnan so constantly frequented the hotel, no difficulty was made in complying with his request, 
and a servant went to inform Monsieur de Treville that his young compatriot, having something important to communicate, solicited a private audience. Five minutes after, Monsieur de Treville was asking D'Artagnan what he could do to serve him, and what caused his visit at so late an hour. "'Pardon me, monsieur,' said D'Artagnan, who had profited by the moment he had been left alone to put back Monsieur de Treville's clock three quarters of an hour. "'But I thought, as it was yet only twenty-five minutes past nine, it was not too late to wait upon you.' Twenty-five minutes past nine, cried Monsieur de Treville, looking at the clock. Why, that's impossible. Look, rather, monsieur, said D'Artagnan. The clock shows it. That's true, said Monsieur de Treville. I believed it later, but what can I do for you? Then D'Artagnan told Monsieur de Treville a long history about the queen, he expressed to him the fears he entertained with respect to her majesty. He related to him what he had heard of the projects of the cardinal with regard to Buckingham, and all with a tranquillity and candor of which Monsieur de Treville was the more the dupe, from having himself, as we have said, observed something fresh between the cardinal, the king, and the queen. As ten o'clock was striking, D'Artagnan left Monsieur de Treville, who thanked him for his information, recommended him to have the service of the king and queen always at heart, and returned to the saloon, but at the foot of the stairs, D'Artagnan remembered he had forgotten his cane. He consequently sprang up again, re-entered the office, with a turn of his finger set the clock right again that it might not be perceived the next day that it had been put wrong, and certain from that time that he had a witness to prove his alibi, he ran downstairs and soon found himself in the street. End of chapter 10 so this chapter seems to have been basically, let me show you how clever D'Artagnan can be, which is good because he can be a complete doofus as well. So it's nice to see him being smart. I mean, he's a smart fighter. We know that he fights smart, but he's also smart in several other ways. And there's another handkerchief. God, we're going to have more handkerchiefs. But especially the end, when the hint is given to him, go somewhere where somebody can prove your alibi, and he goes and turns the clock back for Treville, because who is going to be more trusted than Treville? Right? Fantastic thinking and doing. And that's it. I have nothing else to say about this chapter. I hope you do. You can call in. 206-350-1642. Or don't forget, you can go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Craftlet channel. And from there, you can get everywhere, everywhere you might need to go, including if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, the phone number, which if you're listening on a mobile device, you can tap that phone number and it'll call for you. Or Speak pipe if you're outside the United States and still want to share your thoughts. All righty. I'm going to let you go. You take care of yourself. I will be back in real time and talking to you next week. Have a good one. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlet listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. Mm -hmm.